Good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to be up this early. I know right about now we're all wishing this was um, not a breakfast, more of a lunch, but here we are. Um, I'm very, very delighted to be sitting here with Wally Lamb, with Doris, and with Ishmael Bea, when we are, and these amazing authors. I'm always excited to be involved with anything with respectable authors um, and to be involved with the book community at all since I um, have a television show on the E! Network. So I'm very grateful to every individual here who goes out and sells our books and has our books in your stores and everything you do for the book community. So it is an honor to be here. Um, I um, <clears throat> am not sure how the publishing industry is going or what direction it's going in, but I would like nothing more than to be somebody who's involved in keeping it alive. Um, and, and I was first asked to come here in person and I figured I could just appear on Kindle, but <laughs> They said, no, you're going to have to set your alarm to be funny, which I've never had to do either. I usually do that from 3, p 3 p.m. on. Uh, this, this year, I'm going to release my fifth book, which is called Uganda Be Kidding Me. And it is about all of my trials and tribulations traveling um, as a pompous American in places I have no business being in. On five-star uh, safaris, asking where we can hunt hot live lobster. Um, I was thinking about calling it, <clears throat> are you there, vodka? It's me, Gorby, after Mikhail Gorbachev. But then I realized, A, I hate Russians, and B, I don't know Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, so I decided to tome, write a tome detailing my globetrotting adventures over the past several years. And I've had the incredible experience of being very fortunate in the book community and in the TV community, um, which I can't say for my compatriots, and where I've been to some spectacular places. And I have a merry band of misfits that I take with me everywhere I go. So um, I want to, I was going to talk about that. But I'm looking at all of you, looking at me, and thinking, who gives a shit, really? <laughs> <coughs> I got in here last night at around 2.30 in the morning and fl from Los Angeles, and we pulled up to the Lincoln Tunnel, and I'm like, when can I take my sleeping pill? When can I take my sleeping pill? I have to be up at 6.30 for a book fair. And this 18-wheeler came in right before the Lincoln Tunnel and couldn't fit under the toll booth of the Lincoln Tunnel. And I got out of the car, and I was like, no! <laughs> and there was police officers everywhere, and they were guiding him to back up so he could get back on whatever street takes you away from the Lincoln Tunnel. And I was like, I can't. I have to walk through the Lincoln Tunnel. <laughs> and then I got out of the car to go yell at the guy on the truck who was driving the truck going, hey, buddy, don't you know how tall your truck is? And the police officer looked at me, and he said, Chelsea, get back in your car. I thought, wow, I've really made it. <laughs> so, I would love to read a passage from my book, but it's not ready yet, and I am publicly asking for an extension. <laughs> not joking. Um, I'd love to read a passage, but I wrote it in Swahili, and my translator's been detained in customs. I should have never asked him to bring me a couple pounds of Kenyan skunkweed. Um, but we will have a wonderful program for you, and everyone, each author will get up and tell you about their books. And first up, he documented his incredibly harrowing tale as a boy soldier in Sierra Leone in the memoir, A Long Way Gone. So please welcome Ishmael Bea. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I also want to echo what Chelsea said. Thank you for the introduction. I want to echo what she said about thanking all of you for making uh, our work possible, for making our work accessible to the readers. Uh, you're doing a fantastic job. We're still around, so which means that you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you for that. What I want to do is to perhaps speak a little bit about um, my emergence into writing. Uh, becoming an author. I remember the first time when my first book came out um, in 2007. Uh, I was at some event and somebody said to me, oh, you are, you are that, 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 that author. And it was the first time somebody referred to me in those terms. And it took me about 
two minutes to realize that you're actually speaking to me. And I said, oh, yes, yes, actually, yeah, I am. I am that, that author, and I realized, okay, I am a writer because this book is out. But um, before that, way before that, um, even before I thought about being a writer, I grew up in a, in a, in a place uh, in Sierra Leone, in a country, in a community, in a small village, where as a young boy, um, my imagination was sparked by the oral tradition storytelling that was part of my life, that was part of the daily deliberations of whatever it is that I did. And so at a very young age, I learned the importance of actually telling stories, of how stories um, are pretty much <coughs> escorts of our lives. Uh, stories are the most potent you know, anecdotes for anything that we can en encounter in our lives and how we can deal with them. And also stories are the foundations uh, of our lives and how we build those histories and then pass them on, the most important part, how we pass them on so that the next generation can learn from mistakes, joy, celebrations, and whatever it is that we want to pass, pass on to them. So as a young boy, I knew this growing up uh, because every evening I would sit around the fire and my grandmother or other older people in my community would tell stories. And these were stories that were instructions about the moral and ethical standards of my community, about how to behave. And some of them were just funny stories. Uh, some of them were scary stories to the point that you didn't want to go in the, to the bathroom at night. So there are all sorts of variants of stories that were told. But all of them always had a meaning and a reason uh, for the telling. And one of the techniques that I learned as a very young kid was that whenever they wanted to tell a new story, they would retell an older story. So, and when they were telling that older story, they would add things <laughs> that were not part of the story. Now, if anybody in the audience did not protest, then they knew the audience was not listening. So they would not tell you the new story because it meant you were not ready to receive the new story. So as a boy growing up, this, were part of my, this was part of my life. But to even begin with that, I remember um, I must have been six, seven years old, and my father would put me on his shoulder, and we would walk maybe to the village square if there was a dancing going on and other things. And he would say to me, describe, you know, we're going to play a game. I'm going to pretend that I'm a blind man, and you have to direct me in the places that we're going and describe to me the things that you're seeing. And so I would say to him, oh, well, you know, uh, go left. And he would say, well, what do you mean by left? What is left? <laughs> and then I would try to go, well, you know, if you raise this other hand of yours, you make it this way, that's the left, you know. So as a boy, I had to struggle to describe certain things to him. And I would say to him, oh, there's a fire over there. And he would say to me, well, what is fire? I mean, I'm blind. I've never seen what is fire. Can you describe it to me? Can you make me feel the warmth of it? What is coming from it? And all of these things. So as a boy, this is really how I started uh, thinking about using my mind to describe the things around me. And later on, when I started school, Sierra Leone being a former British colony, so I went to school, I learned Shakespeare and all of these things. Uh, I was one of the literate boys in my community. People would come to me to read letters that their children had written them from the capital city or wherever they are. And so I would read these letters to them and then I would write letters for them as well. It was also perhaps the earliest time for me to start translating because some of the letters were either too long, and so I had to write and just pretty much uh, give the person a succinct version of what the message was about. But the writing part was the most incredible part because I learned about the secrets of my community because people would tell me things that perhaps <laughs> they didn't want other people to know. And sometimes they would say it in the most elaborate way. For example, uh, a, a woman wanted her son to come back home. Instead of saying that, she said, you know, please tell my son, his mother, who was in labor with him for six hours, <laughs> his mother who took him to the river to bathe him every, every morning when he shat in his pants, his mother who did, he went, she went on and on for about seven minutes. All she wanted to say that I miss my son come home. So I'm sitting there listening, so I just read, please come home, your mother really misses you, you know? So I realized at a very young age that to some extent, you gotta get to the point, you know? <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're writing, you want people to follow the narrative structure. Anyway, before all of this, I never thought I would be a writer. I grew up in a community where even though storytelling was a very strong part of our lives, the idea of going to school and becoming a writer was not really something you wanted to discuss with your parents because they said to you, well, this one is useless. Let's take him out and send another kid to school who wants to be an economist and all of these things. These are